Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the recording of Preventive Medicine Grand Round, originally presented on March 7, 2018. I am Lillian Yang, health educator for the Preventive Medicine Residency and Fellowship in the Population Health Workforce Branch, the Division of Scientific Education and Professional Development. The Preventive Medicine Grand Round is sponsored by the CDC Preventive Medicine Residency and Fellowship. This program provides 12 and 24 month full-time service learning opportunities mentored by senior public and population health leaders to physicians, veterinarians, and nurses who have completed the EIS program or have equivalent public health experience. This recording will be available through CDC Trend after April 7, 2018. Instructions on how to access the course in Trend and receive continuing education credits can be found on, on the PMRF website. The URL is um, www.cdc.gov forward slash P-R-E-V-M-E-D dot H-T-M-L. If you have any questions, please email the program at prefmat at cdc.gov. Um, please remember that the views presented by the speakers are theirs alone and do not represent CDC, the Department of Health Human Services, or the U.S. government. Uh, this grand rounds will be practicing quality improvement presented by Dr. Jack Kennedy, District Health Director, and Ms. Galeen Roberts, Director of Quality Management from the Cobb and Douglas Public Health, Georgia. They will once again share their expertise and experiences in practicing quality improvement at the health department. When they presented this to the live audience in early March, the feedback we received was overwhelmingly positive. We are very thankful that they agreed to take the time to help us record this and make it available to a wider audience. Well, welcome, Ms. Roberts and Dr. Kennedy. Thank you, Lillian, for the wonderful introduction. Good afternoon, preventive medicine residents and population health trainees, and along with those joining us on the webinar. We are honored to be able to present today on our experience of introducing and implementing quality improvement efforts in our health department over the past 10 years. And my name is Gerlene Roberts. I'm the Director of Quality Management. I've been in this position for two years here at CDPH and previously worked at a health district in Macon, Georgia in the same role. And I just wanted to mention that during the live recording of this uh, webinar, during the live presentation, I apologize, we use a Mentimeter polling feature to make the presentation more interactive. And so this was how the participants logged in and this was the first slide for their interaction. And throughout the presentation, I have included their responses so that we can use those as for context. So our first question was asking what city everyone had joined us from that day on March 7th. And we, the majority of our residents, uh, attendees, were from Georgia. We had attendees from all over the United States from the west in Sacramento, California, to the north in Summit, New Jersey, to the south in Little Rock, Arkansas, and Austin, Texas, and then in the east in DC. We have 32 respondents to this question. Now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Kennedy. Thank you, uh, Lillian, and thank you, Gerlene. Um, I've had the privilege of being the district health director at Cobb and Douglas public health uh, since April of 2008. Uh, in my prior life, I was a general surgeon uh, and took advantage of an opportunity to get a, a master's in, in business, which helped me in my practice and in other endeavors. So thank you again for uh, joining us today so that we can share our QI experience. Uh, Gerlene and I are really uh, enjoyed the discussion that we had uh, with the live uh, presentation. Uh, so um, thank you again for joining us. To provide some background for Gerlene's presentation, I will briefly cover three items. Uh, first, an overview of our agency, 
Uh, second, a bit about public health accreditation and our personal accreditation journey. Uh, and finally, a brief overview of performance management and our Cobb and Douglas uh, public health performance management framework. As one of 18 Georgia Department of Public Health districts, uh, Cobb and Douglas Public Health serves a population of about 900,000 residents in our two county suburban region in northwest metro Atlanta. We have 330 staff at seven locations. Uh, we provide our services through 29 programs, at least one of which touches the life of every resident in each county every single day. Our county is most notable for the new Brave Stadium, SunTrust Park, uh, which incidentally has awesome tobacco policies. Uh, the Dobbins Air Reserve Base, where our staff and many local, state, and national partners have served in several humanitarian missions in recent years. And finally, uh, our accreditation by the Public Health Accreditation Board uh, in 2015. The Public Health Accreditation Board, affectionately known as FAB, incorporated in 2007, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing the quality and performance of public health departments. The initial draft process and standards were released in 2009 and the first health department accredited in 2013. FAB's purpose, in a nutshell, is to set national standards which encourage and facilitate the advancement of public health practice through the development of a culture of quality improvement. Under the current version 1.5 of the FAB standards and measures, there are 12 domains, 32 standards, and 97 measures covering the 10 essential public health services, administration, and governance. Currently, there are 220 accredited health departments, 31 state, 188 local, and one tribal. This timeline depicts a few high points during our journey to becoming a culture of quality. In 2008, both our leadership team and boards of health agreed that our future vision should stretch and challenge us include achievable goals, and we all believed that the pursuit of accreditation was the very best way to assure this. In late 2008, we hired our first director of our new Office of Planning and Quality Management. In 2009, our leadership team and boards of health committed to work toward achieving FAB accreditation by 2014. In 2010, we started implementation of our accreditation plan by identifying our MAP coordinator and also by publishing How Healthy Are We, a brief health status indicator report for both of our counties. In 2011, we kicked off separate MAP coalition planning efforts in both counties and received a community transformation grant from the CDC to support that work. In 2012, we published our first community health assessment and community health improvement plan. 2013 marked the submission of our final FAB documentation. In 2014, we hosted our four FAB site visitors. And finally, in May of 2015, after addressing a few recommended opportunities for improvement, we received formal notification of our accredited status from the Public Health Accreditation Board. Let's step back just a minute from the details of our agency to look at the big picture of performance management. Performance management is a required component of FAB accreditation in Domain 9, which is to evaluate and continuously improve processes, programs, and interventions. The Turning Point Performance Management System framework was initially developed between 2000 and 2005 by seven states and five national partners to help public health organizations understand performance management and how to develop successful performance management systems. In 2013, the Public Health Foundation released an updated version of the graphic 
and added visible leadership to the framework. Visible leadership, which you see at the top, represents the all-important commitment of leadership and senior management to a culture of quality that does three things. Aligns performance with mission, effectively uses customer feedback, and finally, enables transparency about performance between staff and leadership. The four components of this performance management system are performance standards, performance measurement, reporting progress, and last but not least, quality improvement, the component which Gerlein will address today. As you can see on slide nine, we have our balanced scorecard strategy map. The next two slides demonstrate how we use performance management and quality improvement at our agency. In 2009, we adopted this balanced scorecard as the core of our performance management system to address the first three quadrants of the turning point framework, performance standards, performance measurement, and reporting progress. Here you see our strategy map, a high-level depiction of our mission and vision, which aligns our top-level priorities and objectives with four key perspectives through which we assess our performance. Our mission and vision, which you can see, focus on providing excellent services to our residents. The financial perspective at the bottom of the pyramid represents the foundational resources needed to pay our staff and maintain our programs and infrastructure. The employee learning and growth perspective recognizes the importance of a trained and engaged workforce. The business process perspective encompasses the work we do and the required attention to communications, partnership, and ongoing quality improvement. Finally, the customer perspective, which is at the very top as it should be, focuses us on promoting and protecting the health and safety of our residents. This scorecard has served us well to keep us focused on what we believe are critical success factors and the proper alignment of quality improvement efforts with our mission and vision. My final slide shows the details of our performance management framework. In the center, you see our balanced scorecard, the core of our system, which I just discussed. Our key systems and plans are linked to the, to the four perspectives of our core balanced scorecard. Linked to the left, you see our key agency systems, examples being Qualtrics for customer satisfaction surveys, Insight Vision, our online performance management software, and MUNIS, our administrative, budgeting, finance, and HR system. Linked to the right are our key agency plans, including our community health assessment, our community health improvement plan, our strategic plan, and our quality improvement plan. Gerlene will now discuss the QI component of our performance management system. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Before jumping into the QI portion, we wanted to see where the audience was on the spectrum of QI knowledge. So out of the 26 webinar attendees, we have responses across the spectrum. And we will cater our presentation from the basics all the way to practical tips of application. Most respondents have some knowledge of QI and a lot of knowledge in QI. So it's exciting to see that we have a majority of QI competent slash champion group here. Quality improvement at, at the basics is to focus on improving current processes, not the people. So when we mean current processes, we want to fix the things that are already in place or improve what is already in place before we start thinking about creating new processes or getting new equipment because if the existing process is broken to begin with, the new one is not guaranteed to work. And also we want to focus on processes and not people because a lot of times the process may hinder the person from doing the task that needs to be done. So for example, if we had an employee that was not performing and we fired that person and hired somebody new, there's no guarantee that the new person would be able to do the job if the 
the process is broken in the first place, such as if they needed more training or new, more supervision. So we want to look and see how the process is hindering the people from doing their tasks. Also, this is a culture shift away from status quo. So oftentimes we hear the term, this is how it's always been done, or if it's not broke, don't fix it. So we challenge our staff to try to think about most efficient ways of doing things or doing things because that's the data-driven uh, way to do it, not just because that's how it's always been done. And a little bit of difference between QA and QI, because I think oftentimes this is used in tandem as QA, QI. QA is quality assurance. It also stands for auditing, or um, and this is more reactive. It is done usually once a year by management, and um, you management comes down and sees if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, and if you're not meeting standards, then you have to do a corrective action plan uh, to show how you will address those problems. QI is more proactive. It tries to um, reduce the problems from occurring in the first place. And it's done all the time and it's done by everyone, not just leadership. And so although we have to have QA to function, QI is kind of where we're trying to work towards. Here is an example of why QI is important for you. So think about your morning routine this morning. This is a generic morning routine. So let's say you woke up, you checked your phone or you turned your alarm off, and you brush your teeth, you get in the shower, get dressed, and then you make your breakfast or lunch, and you feed or walk your pets, or maybe you wake up your children, and then you leave the house. And so this is a typical example of how you would get to work on time. Now, if you had to get to work 30 minutes earlier but could not wake up 30 minutes earlier, how would you improve your routine? Here's an example. We could skip checking our phone, or if, say, you had hit snooze a couple of times, we could skip that part. And we could shower at night, could also get dressed, like not dressed at night, but you could put your clothes out at night because oftentimes choosing what you're going to wear takes a long time. You can also pack your lunch or pack your breakfast the night before so that it's already prepared. You can grab and go in the morning. And also you could ask someone to help you with the pets or the children if, you, if that option is available. So these are some ways that we can do QI to our morning routine, and we probably have done this um, many times in the morning, especially if you're running late. So now there are six elements of a culture of quality, and those are depicted here in this image. The first one Dr. Kenny mentioned earlier about leadership commitment. This is the first and most important step for the success and sustainability of a culture of quality. The health director and senior management initiate and lead the process for transformational change. They must dedicate financial and human resources to QI and communicate progress, hold staff accountable, address resistance to change, and exhibit visible support for QI. Then we also have middle managers and supervisors that have to also have some leadership commitment. And they ensure that all employees have direct support needed and are being, able, being held accountable to QI values and behaviors. Without leadership commitment, progress towards the desired state will diminish and likely result in a relapse to the previous state. Secondly, we have QI infrastructure. Once you have leadership commitment, you can start building a QI infrastructure. QI must be aligned with the organization's mission, vision, and strategic plan and linked to in organizational and individual performance. So the following are some components of a strong QI infrastructure. There are three things. So one is a QI plan. This it outlines the organization's QI goals and objectives. This living document provides direction and st structure for QI efforts. And then the second thing is having a a PM, which is performance management, or a QI council. This group governs the agency's quality program. It's responsible for overseeing the implementation of the performance management system and implementing the QI plan, and also revising and updating the QI plan annually. They also provide support for individual QI projects that occur throughout the agency. 
The third thing is having a performance management system. This cyclical process of measuring, monitoring, and reporting progress towards strategic organization division and program goals and objectives provides a structured data-driven approach to identifying and prioritizing necessary QI projects. So the next thing is employee empowerment. This is the third thing is the element of a culture of quality. Leadership should empower staff to infuse QI into their daily work by ensuring they have the necessary awareness, knowledge, skills, resources, and support. This can be accomplished by incorporating QI into orientation, including QI in job descriptions and performance appraisals, providing ongoing training opportunities, granting authority to make decisions, and eliminating fear of consequence or placing blame for participating in QI efforts. The fourth thing is customer focus. Because the customer focus is a core tenet of quality, it should be incorporated into the vision and values of the agency. And we showed you early in our balance scorecard that our customer focus was at the very top of the triangle. Services offered should be customer driven and continuous assessment of internal and external customer needs should drive improvement efforts to meet and exceed customer expectations and prevent dissatisfaction. The fifth, one, the fifth element is teamwork and collaboration. In an organization with a culture of quality, teams have clearly defined performance expectations and gather routinely to brainstorm, solve problems, implement QI projects, and share lessons learned. Collaboration among divisions and programs aids in standardizing processes and breaking down silos. Peer sharing is a norm. Last but not least, we have continuous process improvement, abandoning the notion of perfection. Continuous process improvement is a never-ending quest to improve processes by identifying root causes of problems. Process improvement involves making a gradual improvement in everyday processes to reduce variation and redundancies, improve quality of services, and increase customer satisfaction. Okay, so now we have, a, a, this is Nature's Roadmap to a Culture of Quality, which shows six phases of what a culture of quality would entail. And here we have shown at the bottom, we have our kind of timeline of how we progressed through the phases. And so we began this work in 2012 at the very beginning, and over time, we have kept pushing these efforts. So the biggest jump we see between 2014 and 2016 is when we became accredited and solidified the infrastructure needed for QI. We have not formally taken the assessment in 2018, but plan to do it in the next few months. Based on self-reporting, I think we are near a phase five. Phase six seems to be perfection. It may never be achieved, but we can try to get closer and closer each year. Here's a visual to connect all of these pieces that we have just discussed. The big picture is accreditation, and then having a performance management system really helps you identify where the gaps are so you can do targeted QI to improve performance in the areas that truly matter to your agency. To operationalize QI, this is the infrastructure CDPH has built to support these efforts. At the very top, we have our balanced scorecard, which is our agency's performance management framework. Our culture of quality is a sub-part of our culture of performance management. Underneath this, we interweave our accreditation plans and efforts, of which the QI plan specifically supports our QI goals and the Quality Council. The Quality Council provides QI support agency-wide and functions as a steering committee for QI efforts. They provide facilitation, guidance, and support for QI teams and their QI projects. Some of the teams the Quality Council supports is the business QI team, which focuses on improving billing and administrative processes. The clinical QI team meets quarterly to share clinical QI projects that are taking place in different clinical centers and clinical programs. This sharing forum has been very successful for clinical process improvement collaboration and diffusing the QI culture in the clinical part of the agency because it's tough to take clinicians out of the clinic and provide time to do QI. So each clinic area does QI in their own time, but comes together to share during this meeting. An example of success is that our HIV clinic implemented a doorbell to communicate between front desk and medical assistant staff. And this was adopted by three other clinics, 
It was so simple yet so successful in each of the four areas that it was adopted in. Last but not least, we have our programmatic QI teams. These are any QI teams working on a QI project in their area, for example, epidemiology, WIC, or environmental health. The first two teams were multidisciplinary. These, are typically from, these ones are typically from one programmatic area. For our staff, it has helped us to think about QI in various levels rather than just one type of QI. Let's start at the top. So Big QI is an agency-wide improvement initiative, such as workforce development. For example, if we wanted to improve employee onboarding procedures through our 30, 60, 90-day reviews, we could look at improving the discussion that's occurring and make sure it's not just a checked box so that we are retaining our best employees. And this would be considered Big QI because it affects all employees throughout the agency. Small QI is more program or department specific. It has multiple stakeholders within that realm, but it's not impacting the entire agency. An example here could be uh, if the environmental health food inspectors wanted to convert their inspection forms electronically and use a tablet in the field to eliminate double documentation and paper usage. Individual QI is similar to your morning routine. This is something each person can do to improve their day-to-day -day tasks. Overall, we must have all levels of QI to have a culture of quality, but big QI is typically what you hear about in publications and is submitted for accreditation. QI project teams are multidisciplinary because you must have all perspectives of the process represented. For example, a typical patient flow, which is pictured here at the bottom, would include a representative from each major step which is check-in, registration, lab, nurse, physician, check-out, and the office manager or clinic manager as appropriate. These teams do not have to be huge. Studies show that ideal team management, uh, for ideal team management, we have seven people and no more than 10 people. Or here, five to eight is usually what we strive for. It also helps to have an external facilitator that is neutral to the process. This can be a quality council member, the QI director, or just someone that has experience facilitating. The benefit here is that they can help navigate the discussion to stick to the objectives and keep the meetings focused. For example, in my previous role, I helped, I helped to facilitate a project between the district STD epidemiology staff and county nurses. The district STD staff were charged with following up on positive STD cases to make sure they got tested and treated. The county nurses had to test and report positives to the district STD staff. The STD staff would call the county nurses to get test results and all of this information was in the electronic medical record, but they didn't have access to electronic medical record. So the nurses were pleading for them to just look at the EMR instead of waiting for them to call them back. So through this QI project, we gave the STD staff training and access to electronic medical record. They were able to reduce the turnaround time drastically and follow up in a timely manner, but the facilitation was critical during the meeting so that we could stick to the objective and people would not take things personally. And then we had another poll question about how familiar the attendees were with QI frameworks. Out of 25 respondents on the webinar, the PDSA cycle and Six Sigma were the most frequently recognized frameworks, followed by Lean and Kaizen and Total Quality Management. For QI frameworks, first I want to mention that you can use any QI framework when working through an improvement. There is no right or wrong one, and most of the steps align as shown in this table here between PDCA and DMAIC, which is also Six Sigma. The main difference between PDS, PDCA and DMAIC is based on the stages in the two models. Even though the stages are different, the objective of the stages in the two models are significantly similar as they attempt to achieve a similar outcome. In my experience, Six Sigma is highly dependent on real-time data to move through the process, and public health data is not as readily available or lagging significantly behind, as in manufacturing that numbers and time collection can be automated. With the human, with the human factor, PDSA can incorporate qualitative data to support the significantly lower, lower quantitative data available. 
So here we're going to jump into the PDSA cycle. I'm not going to explain it in too much detail since most of the audience seem to be familiar with it. But here the main goal of the plan phase is to identify an opportunity and plan for improvement. This is, although it's only a quarter of the circle of the PDSA cycle, it really takes 50% of the time because if we don't plan the improvement right, the rest of the testing and study and act won't be as effective. So first we have our aim statement. This is our hypothesis. And we try to have a smart aim statement so that if someone else was reading and they read only the aim statement, they would know exactly what the test was. And then we examine the current approach by doing a baseline process map. It's very similar to what we showed on the morning routine with the steps mapped out. Then we have baseline data, which is important to see if we made an improvement once we get data after the test. And identifying potential solutions, this is where you could do a root cause analysis to make sure you're addressing the right problem and have different, maybe you can prioritize ideas for improvement here. And then lastly, developing an improvement theory. This is an if-then statement. So if something was improved, then what would be the achieved outcome for the team? So simply a vision statement for the team to be motivated to do this work. Next, we have the do phase. This is where we test the theory that we plan in, phase, in the plan phase, and we collect and document data or observations. Data is simply information, so I encourage everyone to use existing data when possible. This can be qualitative, so if you absolutely can't find any numbers, you can do a qualitative um, collection by asking the satisfaction of the process before and after the test to the team members. And you just want to collect enough data to prove your aim statement right or wrong. So you don't have to have a year's worth of data or six months or even three months. You can do this in a week, a day, or a month. So just trying to, real, just trying to compare in a shorter time frame. The third phase here is the study phase, and we use data to study results of the test. So we take the baseline data and compare the data after the test to see how the improvement helped or didn't help. And then the act phase, we either decide if we're going to adopt, adapt, or abandon the improvement. We would adopt the improvement if, if the improvement met the aim statement and we were successful in what we want to accomplish. We would adapt it if we were maybe semi-successful but didn't reach exactly the results that we wanted. And we would abandon a project if um, we just realized that it wasn't fitting our agency or the results were drastically different than what we were expecting. And it's not a bad thing to have an abandoned project. Sometimes that is a good thing. It shows you that, this, that maybe other procedures need to be in place before implementing this improvement. So here are some examples of QR projects that we have done. And although these are, these are laid out in the PDSA cycle, I apologize if this text is a little small. But the first one here is from our HIV program. They want to, their plan aim statement says to reduce the amount of time it takes between patients checking in and seeing the nurse to one minute. What they did was they bought a doorbell to let and put it in a place where the nurse would hear it. And so they would ring the doorbell to let the nurse know that a chart was ready. Baseline data said that it took 10 minutes on average before the doorbell was in place for the nurse to know that the chart was ready. And afterwards it only took a minute because there was a trigger and a quicker notification of the nurse. So they adapted this. Although they met their aim statement, they adapted this improvement because they realized that the bell needed to be moved to a better location so that the nurses could hear it more easily. This project here is from our Babies Can't Wait program, and this is, they wanted to reduce paperwork. So the MCH form stands for Maternal Child Health Form, and it was a four-page form that was part of a 20-page intake packet and the form was duplicative of the other 20 pages, the information on there. So they, their aim statement is to decrease visit intake time by 10%. And they removed this form for one month, and their baseline data says it took about 1,000 minutes to do intake with the form, 
without the form, we took about 800 minutes. So we saved about 14.5% time, which they adopted because their aim statement was 10%, so they may met. And this, this project, the MCH form, although we all want to reduce paperwork, this form had been in place for years. And although the state did said that we didn't need the form, about five to eight years ago, we kept it in there because we thought maybe we'll need it again eventually. So that's how it was always done. And by eliminating the form, there was resistance to change because some people liked using the form because they felt like it was part of their process for getting the paperwork done. So by showing that the results were helping the patients um, have a faster intake visit and helping the staff with less processing of paperwork, the people that were resistant were on board after seeing this, these results. So it helped with change management. Next we have our tuberculosis project. This was focusing on decreasing lab fees and they wanted to decrease lab fees by 90%. So what they did was they trained the staff that was obtaining the information to send to the lab. They trained them on why that information was important and what information exactly needed to be submitted. So once that correct information was entered into the system, the fees went from $6,000 a month to $3,000 a month. And so this was 44% less fees charged per month to the program. And they're adapting this because they AIM statement was 90%, so they're trying to get it reduced to 90%. Our last example here is our child health program. This is a clinical program, and they wanted to reduce the number of self-pay patients that walked out to 5%. So they have self-pay patients and insurance patients, and the insurance patients don't have to pay at the end. They can just leave, but the self-pay patients pay at the end before they leave. So, but they couldn't tell between who is self-pay and who is insurance when all the patients were walking out. So they used visual management. They put a yellow card in the chart to help the staff distinguish self-pay patients from insurance patients. So that's the picture here. I, I know it's a little bit difficult to tell, but the yellow card is at the end of the stack of paper. And at baseline, we had 20% patients walking out that were self-pay, and after the test, we only had 2% walking out. So we had 18% increase in self-pay fee collection. So this is great because they were able to collect more money for the program and also make it, it made it easier for the staff to not have to wonder if they missed somebody. So they adopted this improvement, and they're doing a, Q, a second QI project to reduce the two-step payment collection so that everyone either pays up front or everyone pays at the end. This picture here is a storyboard, and this is a visual with a one-page summary of a QI project. All our QI projects have a storyboard, but I didn't put them on the four previous projects just because I know it's a lot of text. But I just wanted to show you that once you complete a project, this is how we showcase the work that we do in the plan phase is 50% of the storyboard. The do phase is a little bit smaller, but it also the data here is important. And then we have our study and act so that later if somebody else wanted to read how this project went, this storyboard tells you exactly what was done. And we try to include images um, as much as we can. So instead of writing out the steps in the process map, the staff here have used sticky notes and taken pictures of it. And they do attach those full page sticky notes on page two and three of this storyboard, but that's not included just for today's presentation. Now we have another concept called Kaizen. This means continuous improvement. And this is a large scale QI project to improve multiple processes in one project. So for example, um, the previous project that we showed you, that was one process that was improved over several months. With Kaizen, you can do like five projects in the same uh, one project timeline. So the pros here are that you can revamp multiple processes in a short period of time. The cons are that it's resource intensive. So because this work for Kaizen, you need a QI coordinator usually helps to, help to facilitate this work, and you meet really often to track the improvement. So one example here 
we did a Kaizen event, and we took the staff from an entire clinic, which is about 17 staff members, and we did a one-day workshop of basically planning out seven different improvements. And those were, we did process maps from the, in a patient flow, so the lab, the check-in, the nurses, and the check-out. And so we planned seven projects in all of those areas. And then over the next three months, we met every week to see how the progress was going and see if we needed to tweak or add any other improvements. And by the end of the project, we had several improvements done. And that example is on the next slide. So we did two PDSA cycles. The first one was to, it was the CDPH Adult Health Clinic will reduce patient flow time by 25%. So they did seven projects during this Kaizen event, and by the end of the Kaizen event, they had 13 total projects in the different areas that I mentioned, the clerks, the lab, and nurses. And then the study, which is the data, the patient flow time was 75 minutes at baseline and 81 minutes at post-test. And so the, I realized that this shows not an improvement to patient flow, but the big thing that happened here was we implemented electronic medical records during this test time, and so staff were still learning how to use the EMR systems, and that was causing a delay. And we also improved efficiency from the staff perspective, not from the customer per or the patient perspective. And so we adapted this project, and we did a deeper root cause analysis uh, of to why the patient flow time was still so high. And then we realized that the time the nurse spends with the patient was causing a bottleneck, and this was the time that we did not look at in the first PDSA. So the second PDSA, we reframed the AIM statement to say that we will increase the number of patients seen by 25%. And in order to do this, we implemented a team nursing model, and this is often done in private practice or healthcare, and it's usually not done in public health, but basically we paired a nurse with a student medical assistant. We were fortunate enough to have a student medical assistant available, so this did not cost us anything. But the team nurse was one RN to one MA, and they tested it for the morning hours from 8 to 12. For a, It was a few weeks, but the test here, I think, was only about two weeks that we actually measured it. And at baseline, the team nursing model was able to see, oh, sorry, without the team nursing, one nurse was able to see about four and a half patients in the morning. And then once the team nursing model was in place, they saw almost seven patients in the same time frame. So we had a 44% increase. And so we adopted this team nursing model. And in order to do that, we shifted our lab technician roles into medical assistants to provide more support because a lab tech has a narrow scope. But a medical assistant can help in the front office and in the back office with some more clinical uh, activities. And so this was a revolutionary thing for us where we were able to test something that is not traditionally in public health and we felt that this was innovative and it really helped our clinic be more efficient and serve more patients. This is our ramp of continuous improvement and it's just for those that like theory and wanted to understand a little bit of long-term impact of PDSA cycles. So on the bottom we have time, and on the uh, vertical axis we have complexity. And so we have, these are examples of PDSA cycles. So for example, if we did one PDSA on improving patient flow in our adult health clinic in one location, and it was successful, then we would do the same improvement in maybe two of our locations, and if there was things that need to be ironed out, you could iron those out in the first two cycles. And then the third cycle you could do three locations, and if that was successful, then you could do in you know all of your locations in the fourth cycle. And if it was successful, then maybe you could implement it in more than one agency, or you could implement it in a different program. And so this is just showing you that as you do PDSA cycles for change management, it helps to personalize an improvement to the environment you're uh, applying it to. So during our live presentation, we had 22 respondents answer this question about how they felt about change. 
and they answered an average of four out of five on the spectrum of hating or loving change. This is expected for an audience listening to a QI call, but not typical for the general population reflected on the next slide. So this is a normal distribution of how people generally feel about change. A tip here is to involve the innovators slash visionaries first. They will volunteer to help you test the change for improvement without too much resistance. Use this group to show the middle majority how this change could be beneficial for them. The middle majority are against change. They're not against change, but they just don't want to change for change's sake. So you want to show them what's in it for them. Lastly, the skeptics or laggards may never be on board for the change, but they may be in the wrong bus to begin with, so don't waste your time trying to convince this group. Typically, we spend most of our energy here, but if we get 80% of the team on board, this 20% will work itself out. So for final tips for success, using small wins um, and keeping things simple um, will help you get more momentum in the improving processes. And choosing a process in which you have some control, this is really important because oftentimes the first two things that come to mind when you think about in trying to make things better is that we don't have enough staff, staff or we don't have enough money. So those are sometimes things that we don't have control over. But if you set those boundaries and say, okay, these are things that we can put in the parking lot, but what else can we improve? There are, the people in the room can really get creative about the things we can change. Also remember data just has to be useful. It doesn't have to be perfect. We are not doing a research project. And just get started. Don't get stuck in the PP doo doo. And so this just means that don't get stuck in the plan phase and the do phase. Oftentimes we just say, okay, hey, let's test this and you do it, but then you don't go back to see if it worked or to see if it didn't work. You just kind of assume it worked. So get started, but make sure you um, are going through the entire cycle and not just the plan and do phases. Lastly, keep it simple, keep it consistent, and keep it fun. Um, in order to engage staff, this has to be something that's relevant for them and giving them some leeway to empower them on doing improvements that would make things easier for their job is really a good way to make it fun and simple. And also learn from others. This website here is the Public Health Quality Improvement Exchange, phkicks.org. If you go to this website and you type in the search box, um, you know, patient flow, and all the projects that have been published for patient flow improvement will come up and you can kind of do some research on ideas for improvement or you can maybe contact the people that have done that improvement to brainstorm ideas of how you could do it. So in conclusion, QI is an essential management tool in our changing environment because it helps push you to innovate and continuously improve to do things as efficiently as possible. It also helps to make data-driven decisions to help you achieve desired outcomes. These help communicate transparency with staff and also get their buy-in when they have input into the decision making. And also use a framework to work through a process improvement. It doesn't have to be PDSA, but something that will help you work through all of those steps. And we have two final poll questions at the end of our presentation. Out of 16 webinar respondents, all said that they now had a better understanding of how QI can be practiced at their health department agency. And lastly, out of 17 respondents, 12 said they would absolutely use this information in the future public health leadership role, four said they probably would, and one said they might. So then if you had any other further questions, this is where we would discuss that. But thank you so much for spending some time with us. Uh, we are regularly inspired by other public health practitioners and hope that we could inspire you as well. Well, thank you very much both, and I am going to stop the recording.